Again, it is a delight to be with you this afternoon. I am reminded of something that uh, Brother James Bolden used to say. He would say, visitors, we're going to treat you in so many different ways, you're bound to like one of them. I will never forget that, and uh, what a kind, kind man indeed he was, and I, I think of him often. And this afternoon, as we get ready to look at what we're going to be thinking about, we're going to be going to Philippians chapter 3, and that's where we're going to be spending uh, the rest of our time together today, is uh, Philippians chapter 2. As we looked at this idea of the need for care for one another, and looked at this idea that we care, we pray for one another, that we're humble to one another, we submit to one another as we submit to the ultimate model, Jesus Christ. We're thinking about this afternoon where our ultimate goal is and which way are you going? Which way are you going? Now, I've got a little preacher's tale that I could tell right there. That this is my illustration, but I'm not going to do this. And I'm going to share with you a little example. And Michael, I didn't ask you, but I asked Christine if I could share this. So I'm... I'm and this has to do with my brother James. Brother James and I had been to Nashville, and we had gone to see Sister Cleo McBride. Now, before we left here, Brother James wanted me to drive his little truck, and I was like, no, no, I trust you. I'll ride with you. You drive. You drive. And we went, we went all the way to Nashville. We went to see Sister McBride. She was up there having a treatment at uh, Vanderbilt, I think it was. And, and then uh, we had spent quite a morning together. We were coming back in the afternoon. And uh, as we were coming back down 24, he said, uh, well, let's go to Cracker Barrel and eat. And I, well, I never turned down anything like that. So sure enough. And so we got off at this exit and we went under an underpass. Okay. Now the way you were supposed to go was go under the underpass and the restaurant was down there on, on the side of the highway. But as we got down and went under the underpass, Brother James was talking to me, which was not uncommon because he and I could have a really good conversation and we, we were having a good time and he was talking to me. But as we went under that underpass, Instead of going over to the little uh, the access road that runs along the interstate, he turned right and started up the exit ramp for the other side of 24. And he was talking to me, and I was like, Brother James, Brother James, Brother James, I'm not. And he said, what? And I said, we're going the wrong way. And he said, well, I guess you're going to want to drive when we go back then, aren't you? I've been after you. I've been after you. And yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'll do. Yes, sir. I will follow the instructions. But here's the idea is, is that sometimes... We can be, as Christians, when we're trying to get to heaven and we're trying to be caring people for other people and we're trying to be humble before other people, sometimes we go against the grain with the rest of the world. Sometimes we, you know, as far as the world's concerned, they're all going in one direction and we're going the opposite way. And that's what we're looking at here as we, we think about these things from Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to go down to verse 17 if you'll join me there. Brethren... <clears throat> Join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly and whose glory is their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. Watch this. This is really important. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Brothers and sisters, the truth of the matter is this. There's only two kinds of people in this world, people that are headed to heaven and people that are not. And, you know, we don't like to say this a lot because we don't like to be so, uh, so harsh, but there is two places on eternity's side. One is heaven and the other one is hell. We don't want to spend eternity there. So why wouldn't we want to direct ourselves and point ourselves to go toward that glorious place called heaven? And because we care about and because we love other people, we need to be so concerned about them that we follow the pattern that Paul has shown us here to just let our joy for the gospel just leak out of us in every which way we can. Everywhere we go, when we meet people, when we talk to people, let them know that we love Jesus Christ and what he's done for us, pointing us to the greatest treasure of all, that treasure called heaven. 
I find it interesting that Paul here puts it in mind of his citizenship. His citizenship is in that place called heaven. That's a fascinating thing for me because, you know, this idea of citizenship, just like the, the we spoke with using the word slave, this, this, sometimes some of these words bring connotations to us. We don't even like to use them, but we don't even like to talk about citizenship. But I want to tell you something. We need to be excited about having a citizenship in heaven because you know what I've discovered? Since I was here years ago, sometimes when I wake up, it's hard to think up and think of because my feet hurt. Sometimes there's other things that sometimes a phone rings and wakes me up before it's time to get up. And I'm thinking, what are y'all doing? Um, here, here's what it is. And I start my day early. I'm, I'm an early guy. And so, you know, I, I like to be up and moving before five o'clock or by five o'clock at least. And, and when we start thinking about all the things that get in the way. Yeah. And I saw some of them like, well, are you kidding me? Yeah. I love early. I love early. So if that explains if somebody's texted me, if you've texted me past about 9 o'clock, I may or may not get it, okay? But, but that's a whole different thing. The idea of what I'm getting at is, is that we need to be thinking about and excited about that place called heaven. And some folks go, yeah, I want to go to heaven, but not today. I want to pass along a little thought to you. Paul was looking at heaven this way. As we look and study the whole book of Philippians, we're going to see that he said, you know what? It's better for me to stay here for you, but where do I want to go? I want to go to that place with my Savior. I want to be in heaven. And when we think about that together, I can't help but think about what we find in Philippians uh, chapter 3, because as we look at this treasure of heaven, there are uh, three treasures that we need to be drawing from His words to uh, be preparing ourselves for that place called heaven. And the first one is to be prepared for false teaching. Be prepared for false teaching. The next one is, is to consider the fact that we need to be, be, be a becoming people. That means that we're always growing. We're always moving. We're always going. By the way, we're always doing something. So we're either growing or we're dying. We're moving towards God or we're moving away. We don't have any choice. There, there's going to be some movement in our lives one way or the other. If we think we're sitting still, why we're mistaken. So I want to... Emphasize this idea of making intentional decisions to move toward God. When you think up, think up. When you think up and think up, remember that today is a day I want to glorify God. I want to draw closer to Him. I want to show other people about the one who has helped me so. The one who has been, been there that I can lay my concerns at His feet. The one who has walked with me. Because you see... Hebrews 9, 27 reminds us that we all have an appointment with eternity. And we never know when that's going to come. So today, this day, we have a choice. We can follow Him and, and do the things that God would have us to do and spend eternity with Him, or we can turn our back to Him and spend an eternity in hell. And I don't know who would intentionally want to go there. But there are folks who are so bold and brass that they would have to do, want to do those things. And I tell you what, they have no idea of the fear of what's going to be going on there. Unless you've been inside a fire, you don't have an idea of what those things are. When I was, before we came up here, one of the things that I did was I was a volunteer firefighter with our community, but I was also an emergency responder with a chemical company, and I did a lot of interior structure firefighting back in, in the days when I was a little younger. <laughs> and uh, one thing that I learned is, is that being inside a fire, you can't see anything. It's black. The smoke is so thick, without the breathing apparatus, you would be dead. And when you start using water, that's when you start seeing some light because that's when the smoke starts to clear. And it can be a very horrifying place to be and the reason why I share that with you is this, that we need to be thinking of that in as much and going, that's not where I want to be. I want to be in the glory of the Father. I want to spend eternity with Him. I want to be with those who rejoice before our God. That's what I want to do, so I'm going to make some intentional decisions to go that way. Again, Paul makes mention there in verse 20, for our citizenship, he says, our citizenship is in heaven from which we so eagerly wait for the Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. So if we're going to do that, we're going to have to beware. Beware of false teachers. 
There's so much information that comes our way. Why The devil's really good at, at playing games, and he has just covered us all up with a, a, an abundance of words. And a lot of them don't mean a thing. A lot of them are falsehoods, and a lot of them are lies. So we have to make intentional decisions to measure what we hear against God's Word to make sure that those things that we hear we know are true. Beginning of the chapter, Paul says, Finally, my brethren. Beginning of chapter 3, Rejoice in the Lord. And for me to, it's, for me to write these same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. And he says, Beware of the dogs of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation." For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee uh, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Verse 6, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Paul does not mind reminding them of the importance of protecting themselves against false teachers. It's very important that we be mindful of those things. False teachers can use philosophies and they can show degrees and pedigrees and all kinds of things to try to draw us away from God's word and say, well, you know, I did know a fellow one time that I I I was going to ask him some questions about how his stance had changed based on the scriptures. And he said, well, he sent a word to me by way of his secretary. When he has uh, the same kind of educational level that I have, then then we will meet. Well, I'm working on it, okay. But here's the thing. My dad used to say that some people have more education than they have ability to reason. And, and, And I think that that's something that's important. We don't need to try to learn so we can reason away God's word. We need to learn so that we can be building on the faith that we have so that we can explain it with more depth, more passion, and more joy than ever before. And that was who Paul was. Paul was joyous in expressing those things that he had learned and those things that he knew. Pharisee of the Pharisee. He he had sat at the feet of Gamaliel. He was of those who were of great education. And yet Paul would say that all those things would be a waste because in truth, all that was important was Jesus Christ. Paul tells us that he has so much more than many of those who were about in his day. And, And remember now, Paul's writing to the church of Philippi, people who were very near and dear to him and this, this, this very special family, if you will, those friends had become family and, and they were family in Christ and they were to warn each other as he warned them about false teachers and, and, and for be careful about those who would try to justify our wants and then bend truth to get there. God's been very plain about the things he's given us, things that we can understand. And we go down to verse 7 and continue there. But what things were gained to me, these I've counted for loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things for loss, for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. And found in Him, and found in Him, not having my own righteousness which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings and being conformed to his death, if by it any means I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Again, all those degrees and pedigrees, those things were, 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 were of no value if, if, if he had allowed those things to get in his way and his relationship with God And that's what Paul is telling the Philippians, that the treasure of heaven is greater than anything. It's greater than anything we could possibly imagine. Paul's experience in life made him uniquely qualified to teach and to warn against false teachers and even to warn against what I have termed lethargic Christianity. Lethargic Christianity. You know, you know what I mean by lethargic Christianity? I will tell you a little secret too. 
when I'm teaching people, particularly young people, I will say, you know what? I appreciate that you guys honor the fact that I got a little gray hair now. But if I use a word that you don't understand, you need to ask me what I mean by that. Because when I was growing up, I remember that I heard the preacher and he would say such and such and he would use the word infidel. And he would say infidel. I knew it must have been bad because he made a face. I didn't know what it was. I had to have somebody teach me. But so, so when I'm talking about lethargic Christianity, what am I talking about? I'm talking about pew warmers. People who come in and they check in and they check out. I'm here and then I'm gone. I just show up and then I'm out. And by the way, you know, I have been, and Bill, you may have experienced this too. I've been the preacher that somebody came to the back and said, well, you should be glad I'm here today. You ever had that happen to you? People will do that. They'll say, oh, you should just be glad I'm here today. I should be glad you're here today. Well, I am glad that you are here today, but what are you here for? We should be here when we gather to worship our God. You know, home, when we get started, I usually get up and, and, and greet folks to get started, and I will say, you know what? This is the most important thing we're going to do all week. So with all of the busyness that we have within the family here, with all of the things that we are doing, we need to set those things aside for a moment and just push them out of our minds and put our God in our minds. He's the one that we need to be thinking about. He's the one who gave us all that we have. He's the one who provided all these things, and we need to be thinking about Him and our desire to go and be with Him. We all have an appointment. The choice is ours on this side. So it's important that we think about these things and that we're weary of those who would try to excuse and draw us into lethargy when our Christianity is involved to draw us away from the mighty God. We need to be a folks who are never satisfied with our Bible understanding. We need to be studying from God's Word. There was a fellow, he was related to the Perry. Some, some may remember that name, uh, Blanche Mayhew, or buried out here in the graveyard. And uh, Brother Max look through these Coke bottle glasses. He had been preaching longer than I've been alive now, so that was a long time. And, and he said, you know, Jeff, I learned something from this book every day. We don't understand often how deep that book, the Bible, is and what we can learn from it. We can learn from it so many things about how to treat others, how to be others, and how to, how, how to do the very things we've talked about today, how to care, how to pray, how to be humble before others, and how to think about heaven and look forward to the glory when we can all be together. Because, you know, one of the things that I enjoy about being here, I, I mentioned this, I felt like it was a homecoming being up here. But, you know, Sometimes I'm bothered by the fact that we have to be in a rush because people have got things to do. We've got places to go. We've got to go back home. You know, and I was thinking about the fact that you, you guys are going to have Eric Owens here, and I love Eric. He, he worked at a congregation in Avondale, which was not very far from where Conyers is, for, for a lot of years. He's out in Texas now, and oh, do I miss him. He was a great, he's a great young man. and I say young man. It's, he, well, I don't guess we are so young anymore. But anyway, uh, I, I'm, I really appreciate him. But I look forward to a day when all the saints, we can be together and we can just catch up at our leisure and have all of eternity just to fellowship one with another and bask in the glory of our God. What a great time it will be not to have to live in the constraints of time and be able to be before our God. So we need to be aware of false teachers and we need to be a becoming people, always coming closer and closer to God by the way that we study. When we look at verse 12, Paul says, not that I have already attained, not that I have attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may hold, lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Paul says, I'm not complete. Of all people, Paul, he says, I'm not complete. I'm not complete, but I press on. I stretch and I reach. I try to go forward. He continues reaching forward and pressing forward. For what? To lay hold of that which Christ laid hold of for him. Salvation is what he's talking about. Knowing how desperately he needed it. You and I knowing how desperately we needed it. And so very thankful for it. And Jesus tells us, by the way, if we'll think about our Savior, that as we draw nigh unto Him, James 4, 8, we, 
we'll find that he will draw nigh unto us. And we need to be those who are believing in him and doing truth. Doing truth. That's what we find in John 3 and verse 21. To do truth. To do those very things. So doing truth means repenting of sin. Acts 17, 30. We, and it means pushing those things out. And that may mean readjusting the schedule. Putting some things to the side that need to be put to the side and putting things important back where they belong and putting our thoughts about God. And sometimes, you know, when we do something new, it doesn't feel so good. But the results are awesome. You know, I've changed some things about the way that I live here recently, try to eat a little cleaner and do some things. And, and you know, it's really benefited me in a number of ways. Well, one thing is I got, I got five grandchildren. I got to run fast to keep up with them. But it, when it comes to our spiritual lives, that is what's most important. And we need to be people who are thinking, you know, what do I need to do? How do I need to change? At home, we, we, we use chronological Bibles, daily chronological Bibles. Well, you can pick one of those things up. You can get them all on Amazon. You just open them up, and it will say, well, today is March, what is it, 16? 17, okay. <laughs> March 17, and you can go in and read March 17. And then you just go on and read the next one. You can go on and read the next one. And then if you get behind, you can catch up and read. You can go forward and read. That's what Sydney was talking about earlier. She told somebody that I had read all the way out to September. Well, I'm trying to do two or three versions this year, so I'm trying to get on further out there. But the thing is, is that when we do that, it's also good to maybe have somebody with whom we're reading those things together and say, hey, you know, did you read this? When did they put that in there? I remember I had a conversation with a man. He was an elder for many, many, many years. And he would say, you know, Jeff, every time I read through this book, I see something else and ask myself, when did that get in there? So when we, we think about God's word, the study is endless. Our ability to grow is endless. We can become, we can grow closer to him, if we, but we've got to make intentional decisions to do so. We've got to point ourselves in that way. And that may mean having to make some changes. That's what repentance is that we see there in Acts 17, 30. And we understand that as we, we repent and, and make some changes, if never having done it before, we might need to be those who are openly confessing that we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He tells us that in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 32. But he also tells us that if we deny the Savior, that he'll deny us before the Father. And I don't know you, but on Judgment Day, I want Jesus to call my name. I don't want to be stuck with all those sins. Because he died on that cross at Calvary, we have the opportunity to take advantage of the blood that he shed in order to be saved. But you see, he made that comment about denying men. And a lot of folks say, oh, we would never deny God. How do we live? Once we confess that we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that's not where the story ends. We need to live lives that confess that we believe that Jesus is the Christ. And sometimes those can be weary lives. We can have people who are close to us who will just wear us and wear us. And then what we need to be doing is remembering the one who loved us so and he understands how you feel. He does. He understands how we feel so that we can become closer every day. And if having not done it today, you've heard already that we've talked about the fact that you can be baptized to have your sins forgiven. And that's not the end. That's where the life begins as a Christian. That's where we begin our Christian walk. And when we look at those things together, we come up as a, a new creature, as we see there in Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, we spend the rest of our days becoming. The world will grab us and wear us down because the devil doesn't want us to pay attention. He wants us to be so busy in busyness that we miss the whole program. We're up and we're worried about things and we're worried about, oh, we got to get this one here and we got to do this and we got to go there and we got to do this and that and the other. We've got all these things to do. But the question is, when it comes to eternity, where are you headed? Which direction are you going to go? It requires intentional choice and we have to stick to the pattern because if we get off the road somewhere, we lose our way. There are too many that we read about that we find do that very thing. Have, have once had their faith in, in Jesus Christ. And you've known people that were that very way too. People who, who were very excited about being Christians. And then somewhere along the way, something happened. Maybe it was a tragedy or maybe it was slow. But however it is, they got themselves off the road. 
We need a call to them. Come home. Come home. Just like calling the prodigal son. Come home. Because this is what's important. We all have a date with eternity. And because of that, we need to be thinking about where we want to be. And that place called heaven is certainly where we want to end up. You know, we look back at verse 13 and he said, I don't count myself to have apprehended. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which were behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Paul says, I've not yet attained. But Paul Paul said, I've not yet attained. So when we're reading our Bibles, and you think, well, I've read that before. Think again. Think again. Paul said, I've not yet attained. I reach. I strive. I'm after that. I'm looking for those things. He's reaching. He's stretching. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. This idea of pressing and stretching and, and, and doing all those things. Sometimes we don't like those ideas because as my mother used to call the physical therapist, she would call them physical terrorists <laughs> because they make us stretch and they make us reach. Well, spiritually speaking, we need to be stretching and reaching toward our God. We've studied today about the mindset of Christ and Paul is talking about here a mature mindset. It does take a mature mindset to self-evaluate and to think about these things. And so he, he left off with this idea that heaven is real and the real treasure is prepared for you and I as well. And if we want to take part in that treasure, then we need to be obedient to the gospel. But if you want to keep that gift, then we have to live a life that confesses that we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And Paul goes on to give us, uh, finally, a, a, the idea of beholding. Look with me at verse 17. He said, Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have for a pattern. I love the idea of a pattern because that means somebody else figured it out and I don't have to. All I got to do is follow whatever they said to do. And that's what Paul is giving us here. He said, he said follow me in this pattern. Jesus said... <coughs> Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men, Matthew 4 and verse 19. But some try to make their own way. They want to go their own way. And Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say, Luke 6, 46. So it, it requires some attention, some thought, some intentional decisions to go and to follow after him. It's turning away from the easy way to want and convenience, but to put him first. There's two big things I want to look at before we close this lesson. And the first one is this, the idea of citizenship. Where's your citizenship? I mean, really, where's your citizenship? I can't see your spiritual passport. Only you and God know where those things are. But where is your citizenship? We have to ask ourselves questions. Have I been living and doing the things that God would have me to do and pleasing God and glorifying Him? So with, with that in mind, the second big thing I want to look at here is this idea of our eternal existence in that eternal body. That body that has no pain. That body that's never too cold. It's never too hot. It's never alone. Always in the glory of the Father with those who love Him. Your citizenship is where your loyalty resides. And that can be found in the way that we live our lives and the actions that we have. So the questions that we need to ask ourselves are these. Have you been heeding God's word? Have you been aware of those who potentially would teach false doctrine and be aware of them? Have you been becoming and one who is becoming closer and drawing nigh unto God? Have you pictured in your mind beholding the glory that is called heaven and drawing to that place? There was a story that I heard, and if you'll bear with me for just a few more minutes, I'll share this with you. It's the story of the fork. Have you heard the story of the fork? The story of the fork. There was, uh, there was a lady who had terminal cancer, and she had told the preacher that when she was buried, she wanted to be buried with a fork in her hand. And... and 
the preacher said, now you need to explain this to me. And she said, well, my grandmother was buried with a fork in her hand. And he was like, well, it's family tradition. What's up with this? And she said, no, you see, when I was growing up, when we were had a big dinner together, somebody would say, keep your fork because the best is about to come. And after we had a big meal, why there'd be a big old piece of cake or a big old piece of pie coming, and we knew we needed to keep our fork. So when I go and I leave this world, I'm, I'm going to leave this world with a fork in my hand so that when people are standing over my body, and they say, why is that fork in her hand? Because the best is yet to come. Let's think about that together for a minute. That place called heaven will be so glorious and just so beautiful. What a place to behold and what glory it will be to be there with the Savior. What a wonderful thing it will be to be able to be with all those that we love and are like-minded with. So why wouldn't we put him first? And why wouldn't we want that to leak out to everybody we see? That we love Jesus. This afternoon, you've heard what you need to do in order to be saved. But as a child of God, it could be that your vision of heaven has been taken in a different direction because of the challenges of this life. There's nothing that we would rather do than to pray with you and for you. Dear friend, if you have any need at all, be his now as together we stand and sing.